With the mention of one name, Red Adair, so many images are conjured. One of the most familiar is the image of flames hundreds of feet in the air and a lone silhouette standing just feet from the blaze. He just took the bull by the horns and uh, did it. And that's, that's how it all worked. That was one of his, uh, his better traits. He was just a um, little, short, fiery, red-headed person. And uh, he, um, he got things done. He just, uh, what, whatever needed to be done, well, that's what was done. Everybody thought he was a lot larger than he really was. You know, he wasn't, wasn't a rig, very big person in statue, but you thought he was. Well, he just always came off as real self-confident and, you know, this is how it's going to be. And, you know, real loud and boisterous type person and just enjoyed life. I mean, he pretty much always had the attitude that there wasn't any such thing as can't. You know, we'll figure this out and we'll get it done. If you can't, you can't stay. That was kind of something he kind of lived by. In 1938, Red was hired by the Otis Pressure Control Company, his first oil-related job. In 1940, while working on a site with Otis, Red was working in the area under the drilling floor when the well blew out. The well released a cloud of natural gas that also contained a petroleum vapor similar to gasoline, H2S, a volatile mixture just waiting to explode. While everyone else ran for cover, Red Adair maintained his ground and studied the problem. He got a lot more serious. He was a, a lot more cautious type person than you would expect when, when we were around wells. You know, it's, it wasn't ever any kind of fear thing. It was just a serious respect for what you're doing. And if you cover all your bases, you'll come out of, you know, this eliminates a lot of chance for error. Eventually, devising a solution, Red ran to his vehicle to get the tools to kill the blowout. His boss at the time said that it was not Red's job to close in the well, but in typical fashion, Red said he didn't know whose job it was, but someone had to do it. Thus began the legend of Red Adair. After serving his country in World War II, Red returned to his hometown of Houston and to his first love, the oil field, developing his skills with a man by the name of Myron Kinley, who some consider the grandfather of modern oil well firefighting. After 14 years with the M.M. Kinley Company, Red resigned and formed Red Adair Company, Inc. to control oil well fires and blowouts. Through Red Adair Company, Red pioneered the development of modern-day effective wild well control techniques and equipment and earned his reputation as best in the business. People liked him, oil company personnel liked him, and it made it a lot easier to go ahead and, and perfect this stuff because it cost money to do it. And um, if you have a liking, which Mr. Adair, everybody liked Mr. Adair, and they, um, they would get in there and, and um, help him do that. And, and like I say, money was, was a big object. Mr. Adair was, a, was an excellent salesman because he could get in there and, and tell the, the people on location what the problem was and, and uh, transfer it right back up to the top of the oil companies and, and everybody would agree with his decisions. With a fairly modest start, what was to come next in the life of Red Adair would set the course for a career recognized throughout the solar system, literally. Five, four, ignition, GRR. In 1962, the space race was on. In the Sahara Desert, a single well had blown out and caught fire. Flames shot thousands of feet into the atmosphere. It was dubbed the Devil's Cigarette Lighter. It gained a lot of notoriety because the astronauts, when they were first getting started, commented about seeing the fire in the desert. And uh, that was Adair's first big claim to fame after he had left the Myron Kenley organization. So. It just did a lot for the company. And the publicity didn't stop there. Luxury watchmaker Rolex found the image they wanted to portray with their timepieces and perhaps the most recognizable photograph ever snapped of Adair. In one of the, one of the magazines in the uh, Houston Chronicle, but uh, we were on a job in Mineral Wells, Texas. And uh, his son and I asked him if we were gonna get off for Good Friday 
And he was, <laughs> he said, no, if you get off, it'll be because I run you off. And he was pointing for us to go back to work. And uh, with, you know, it just turned out to be a good picture that this Rolex showed up good and everything about it. So I, I do remember that being when that happened. The 1960s were a good time for Red Adair. Business was booming. He was making a name for himself. And near the end of the decade, Hollywood called. Red was asked to be the technical advisor on the 1968 movie, Hellfighters, starring the most recognizable public figure of all time, John Wayne. We, um, as a matter of fact, we, um, all the firefighting equipment that they used, they um, um, was Red Adair Company. And then we actually built the fires for him. We used our fire pumps to pump propane and some other um, diesel to uh, build the fires when they burned the rig down. And uh, that wasn't a weld. We, we actually <laughs> burned it down. We got to participate down here at Baytown. Not really participate, but got to watch because there wasn't anybody from the company in the movie or any of us. Got to meet John Wayne, have go to some of the advanced deals where they, you know, look at the the day's shooting it and things like that. It was a lot of fun. The star and Red formed a bond and often spent time together during breaks from shooting. He was a real down to earth person and uh, at this we were at this one particular boat race down at the old uh, Bayshore Boat Club. He got off of uh, one of the big boats, yachts down there and stepped through the pier. And, um, fortunately, I had the only pair of jeans big enough to fit him. They were too short, but they were big enough around. So anyway, he wore my blue jeans the rest of the day. And uh, I handed him a, I was getting on the boat to get a drink and he said, took my cup out of my hand and he said, uh, and mixed it out of his, handed it back to me. I took a drink of it and it was pure bourbon. I said, whoa, what was all the mixing about? He said, I'm trying to get the ice cubes even. I wasn't mixing it. <laughs> he was just, you know, good, lots of fun. They got along real well and I guess become lifelong friends. Mr. Adair used to go out there a lot. To, in California, they'd always tag up. I don't know if he ever came back here or not, but uh, we were out of the country. I think Richard's the only one in, in the States when they premiered the movie here, but, uh, and I never really got to see him after the movie was finished.